Welcome to the Women Changing the World podcast, a podcast on a mission to bring you some of the most amazing women I know who are doing incredible things to generally make the world a better place. From corporate sustainability to straight up magic and everything in between, you'll meet the real life humans who are birthing the new. I'm your host, Liz Best, and I'm here to amplify the stories and voices of women who are changing the world. Welcome to another new episode of the Women Changing the World podcast. Today's podcast conversation is on a topic that is close to my heart, which is closing the gender pay gap. I am so excited to sit down with Maloney Takrar, who is the founder and principal of Mind the Gender Gap, to talk about all sorts of things from data feminism to data storytelling and the roller coaster that is entrepreneurship. I just know you're going to enjoy my conversation with Maloney as much as we did. Welcome to another episode of the Women Changing the World podcast. I'm so excited to be sitting down today with Maloney Tukrar, who is the founder and principal of Mind the Gender Gap uh, and just an all-around incredible human being. Welcome to the podcast, Maloney. Thanks for having me, Liz. Happy to be here. Of course. I'm so excited. I feel like we have so much to talk about. Uh, maybe before we jump in, would you mind just giving like a, a quick introduction to those of our listeners who may not already know you? Sure. Um, so as um, Liz already mentioned, I'm the founder and principal of Mind the Gender Gap, which is a boutique consultancy that focuses on advancing gender equity in the workplace. Um, in addition to being a business founder and owner, I'm a proud daughter of East African Indian immigrants um, whose legacy has very much shaped and informed the person I am today and the work that I do. Um, and outside of working in and on my business, um, you'll most likely find me trying to recreate my late father's recipes and writing down the memories and stories associated with those. Oh, I love that so much. What's the most fun thing that you've cooked recently? Um, I don't know if it's necessarily fun, but it was definitely challenging my comfort zones is um, I baked a bundt cake. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> because um, it was recently his um, birthday had just passed and um, his his bundt cakes were as a regular feature at many family and friend gatherings. Um, and so I challenge myself to um, baking. Oh, I love that. I uh, I did not know I could bake until the pandemic. I didn't have the attention span for it. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I was like cut and bake cookies exclusively, but I've gotten better. So <laughs> I really admire the bunt cake attempt. Um, well, I'd love, I'd love to uh, – Talk a little bit more. I mean, I know we're going to talk a lot more about Mind the Gender Gap today, um, but I would love, like, to the extent that you want to tell us a little bit more about how it came to be, what it's about, um, would love to hear everything. The work I do at Mind the Gender Gap um, has been very much influenced and shaped by a series of pivotal experiences in my professional life. Um, And... I'd be remiss to say it's also very much influenced about uh, my personal life and even how I arrived into this world. Um, my mother, um, when she first set foot on American soil, she was an immigrant from, she was born and raised in Malawi and had recently immigrated from the UK. And this was all in the middle of the Reagan recession when she first arrived here. And it was not too long after her arrival that she landed a job 
uh, a minimum wage job at a Toys R Us. And not too long after, she was able to secure uh, employment at a life insurance company that came with some benefits such as maternity leave and health insurance, which is both critically important for expecting mother. And when I look back and think back uh, at that time, um, you know, I, I really reflect on how miraculous it was for her being a brown skinned um, immigrant from East Africa, almost six months pregnant at that point when she landed the job with benefits. And it would be no less miraculous today Mm -hmm. uh, for a woman in that profile to, to land a job with benefits. And, you know, especially in, when we think in light of the pandemic and the mass exodus of women leaving the workplace, including mothers and including women of color, um, that, you know, it's really important to like recognize the moment in time we live in where, women's labor force participation rates have reverted back to what they were in 1987. And when we think about the gender gap, um, you know, the most recent World Economic Forum report uh, estimates that it will take 267.6 years to close the gender gap when it comes to economic opportunity and participation. And when I think about this work, it really comes from this place of impatience in a lot of ways that I don't think any of us should wait that long to close the gender gap. And really with this hope for and vision for a more gender equitable world um, where um, everyone, regardless of their gender identity, um, can be treated with dignity and respect and have agent economic agency over their lives. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, 267 point, I don't remember the decimal, but (laughs) either way, (laughs) that's way too long to wait. Um, That's way too long to wait. And I know that um, it must have felt like such a miracle for your mom to, to get access to those benefits when she was six months pregnant. And I've just watched so many women, especially over the past couple of years, have to make some really hard choices about participation in um, in the labor market, about their jobs and employment um, and child care and all of these things. And I just really hope, I mean, through the work that you're doing and some policy innovation, I mean, it's going to take so much for us to get to a place where the gender gap is closed, but it's so clear that it is unacceptable, the thought that we might have to wait more than 200 years to close it. Um, And I would love to hear, so I know you're doing some really cool work to tackle this from, you know, multiple different angles. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit about what your current day-to-day looks like? Well, you know, there's no day looks the same. (laughs) Um, When I think about like how I structure my day, um, it's informed by a few uh, different things or key practices or principles, so to speak. Um, And one of them is really thinking about and identifying, you know, what are the top three uh, priorities I need to get done that day and how does that align with my bigger vision for creating a gender equitable world um, and also really balancing working in the business versus on the business mm-hmm. and what one of the things that helps me sort of s- structure that is having uh a particular day focus on a particular aspect of the business. So for example, on, on Fridays, I really attend to a financial and legal matters. So if there's anything that my lawyer needs to review or I need to send to my bookkeeper accountant, that those are taken care of. Um, and then another key piece of it is um, calibrating between creating, learning, and working. And what I mean by that is you know, as an entrepreneur, I think it's really important that we're consistently creating things and putting them out in the world to position ourselves as thought leaders and to, you know, make the the influences and changes we want to make. 
um, I think with, uh, you know, continuing to invest with in learning is also critical just to stay um, in uh, ahead of the curve in the work that I do. And then working is in essence, working on client and work and projects and making sure that um, that is being, um, that is moving along. And I think the last piece of that is just like managing, um, in addition to managing my day to day is really um, comes down to managing my energy Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, and really uh, making sure I'm structuring my day in a way that I'm being productive. And I, I sort of realized over the years that like sticking to a schedule when it comes to things like eating, sleeping, and exercising um, allows me to be more productive in my work and more present in my work. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's like, I, I think the idea that well, I can say for myself, I had of like entrepreneurship and like what it would look like to, to own all my time uh, had so much less structure than is actually necessary for me to make productive use of my time. Right. Yeah. So um, I I so appreciate that. And I guess um, to go a little bit deeper on the work piece and the client piece, uh, totally appreciate that like actual clients may be confidential and not something you can disclose. But can you give us a sense of like who you work with or who your dream or ideal clients are? Yeah. So th- over the years through this work, um, I've, I've gained quite a few insights of um, who I want to work with or who's the ideal client. So in doing this work, it's important that we partner with companies that are forward thinking when they think about advancing gender equity in the workplace. And part of that involves a few different things. So when I think about the work that I do, I um, often use and leverage technology and data storytelling um, to help um, companies invest in solutions that are both sustainable in the long term and will really have um, make an impact. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so part of that really means that they need to have a culture that is data driven. Um, And so many of the clients I've worked with over the years, um, sometimes I have to explain to them what data storytelling is and what is the value add Um, when it comes to influencing their culture and their day-to-day practices. Um, I also think it's important for the companies to understand that while it's important to address certain things in the short term, um, it's also important to invest in long-term solutions as well. And so that requires both a commitment and investment both in terms of time, energy, and resources. And so when there's alignment there with um, key values and culture, I've I've found it to be a great fit. Um, And in terms of just like the profile of my ideal client, I found companies that are, if they're too small, they haven't, they're not quite ready to, move the needle in a meaningful way because they're still building out their infrastructure to do so. Um, And on the other end of things, when companies are too big or mammoth in size, um, it seems like they're well-established in their way. So it's hard to um, catalyze change in those environments. Um, So I found like the sweet spot has been somewhere in between where they're still on their growth trajectory and they're still open to learning and adopting new solutions. Totally, totally. That makes so much sense. And is there a number that of employees that goes with that or, or revenue or is it like kind of depends on the company and you know it when you see it? Well, with the with the with the number of employees, I found between um, like two hundred to three hundred employees is typically the sweet spot. Um, but obviously, you know, I take that into account on a case by case basis. Gotcha. Oh, that's so interesting. Cause yeah, I mean, obviously there's organizations with everything from like two people to so many thousands of people. Um, I feel like that's a really cool, uh, 
like moment in a company's growth to to start to plug some of this in. Um, so I know it has been a journey for you to get to where you are today. Um, obviously, I love the origin story of your business. Um, and I would love to hear from like, and you can start truly wherever it makes the most sense for you to start. But how did you come to be where you are today? And uh, I so love like all the twists and turns to the extent that you want to indulge us. So I would be remiss without acknowledging like I did not get here alone. Um, And when I look back on both my professional and personal life uh, about and think about the things and people that helped get me here, um, first and foremost is having a great group of mentors and advisors along the way. I'd say at each critical phase in my career, um, I had a mentor and advisor that was instrumental in helping me carve my own path. (laughs) And sort of relatedly, which sort of really speaks to the work that you do, Liz, is um, having a intentional community of peers has also been really um, helpful for me, Um, both in terms of thinking how we can be mutually supportive of each other's dreams and goals um, and vision for the work that we want to do, but also being thought partners uh, for each other when trying to navigate um, challenges and obstacles that often come up Um, when going down this path. Um, And I think in addition to that, um, I've found this continued continued commitment and investment in uh, learning and reflection has been critical. Um, Whenever, whether it be a project or experience comes to a close, like it's important to take that time to reflect on you know, what about that experience um, worked well for me? What didn't work so well for me? What are the things I need to work on and further develop? Um, And that's sort of been important for ensuring that I'm continuing to learn and grow um, along the way. Another thing that has been important as most entrepreneurs can speak to is just being persistent and consistent and how we show up, um, you know, quite often things are, you know, I, as an entrepreneur, I've been doing things for the very first time, um, and they don't always work out as I hope or envisioned to be. And I think the the importance is not um, always getting it right, but learning how to figure things out and learning how to keep and stay the course and um, continue on. Um, day by day. Um, And then lastly, it's, for me, it's been important to sort of build systems and habits that are supportive for the vision of the work I want to do and really help move me along between where I'm at and where I want to be. So those are some of the things that have sort of helped me get to where I am today. I so appreciate your sharing that. And as you know, like I couldn't agree more, both in terms of the importance of having community and the importance of having like mentors and advisors along the way and just acknowledging that, you know, no one like self-made is such a myth, (laughs) right? Right. Uh, But um, but yeah, and then the systems and processes, I think, too, are are just so essential in in making things repeatable. And I love the, the call out to consistent and persistent. Um, and I'm curious, like, would you be willing to share a little bit more of your career journey of um, kind of like from, again, you can start wherever it makes the most sense, but, you know, what other work you've done that led sure. you to create this company? So I launched my career working as a federal investigator at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And... You know, as someone who was a naive recent college grad, uh, that experience was very eye-opening to me in a lot of ways. Um, you know, at the at the core of the work that I did there in that role, 
was really listening and witnessing firsthand um, the adversity and challenges people had to face um, when trying to make an honest living. Um, And although I was well aware that there was legislation in place that prohibited workplace discrimination, um, I really became acutely and painfully aware of the gap between what those laws and policies were designed to do and how they actually played out when it came to enforcing them. Um, And that sort of really set me on this path of, and start to invest, explore the question of like, well, what role can I be in so that I can be part of proactively addressing the issues that relate to workplace discrimination, particularly for women and women of color uh, versus being in a position where the harm has already been done and addressing it in, you know, dealing with the aftermath of that. Um, And so from there, that sort of informed my decision of, studying gender and social policy um, at the London School of Economics. And the reason I went abroad is at the time, I couldn't find a program in the U.S. that really um, focused on bringing a gender lens when it came to policy. That has since changed, but at the time, that wasn't the case. Um, And what that experience did at LSE, I wrote my master's thesis on um, uh, you know, intersectionality and, employ- and how do you apply an intersectional lens when it came to employment discrimination and looking at both and comparing both the US and the UK context. Um, and so that really brought in my perspective on how um, you know, U.S. sort of looks at and analyzes uh, issues related to intersectionality and workplace discrimination, but also how um, the U.S. compares to other countries in the world um, and provided me, gave me a more informed global perspective. Um, And then from there, I started to do more work in qualitative and quantitative analysis. Um, I worked for a policy research firm um, in research and evaluation firm for several years. Um, and that's where I really got to sort of apply bo- the things that I learned both in my previous work experiences as well as in grad school in a more applied setting. Um, and w- was able in that role was able to work in a variety of sectors and um, a variety of projects that varied in scope and size and client profile. So in essence, that experience trained me to be a generalist. And what sort of was nagging at the back of my mind is how do I return back or, um, you know, get get back on track to being a specialist because I, you know, had specifically sought out this program that focused on gender and social policy. And when I kept um, sitting with that question, what came kept coming up for me is this need or yearning to carve my own path. Mm. Um, and so that's partly why eventually I felt the need to... Um, join this crazy ride of becoming an entrepreneur, um, which has both been both thrilling and, um, you know, at times very scary and anxiety producing. (laughs) But um, along the way, and you've been very much on this part of this journey with me of like, there's been these very validating experiences that are confirming that I should continue to put one foot on the front of the other. Um, and so that's partly why, uh, what, and what's been most validating is working with clients and seeing um, how their work is shifting and changing um, once I work in partnership with them mm-hmm. um, and, and help 
and into the service of this broader and larger vision of creating a more gender equitable world. Like that's in essence um, makes up for all of the hardships um, that I have to face along the way. Uh, totally. Thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, entrepreneurship is such a roller coaster, even on like the best day. I feel like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I describe it as you're riding a roller coaster blindfolded and you don't know when you're going to get off. Mm. Oh, that feels so real. <laughs> <laughs> and it is like there are these moments and I feel very similarly in that it's like the the moments where like the impact of the work that I'm doing with someone is apparent, like, you know, is is when you're like, oh, yes, like. It, it feels so good. It's so exciting. It's so rewarding. Um, and holding that vision, like, in between those moments uh, is definitely, like, an art <laughs> and a science. Yes. yes, for sure. For sure. Um, well, because this is the Women Changing the World podcast, I have to ask you, I ask everyone, you know this question's coming. Um, If you could change one thing about the world, what would be the one thing that you would pick? Well, if it hasn't been implicitly obvious (laughs) by uh, how I've described my work, it it is really to close the gender gap. And so there's no, in in create a world where there's no longer the need of mind the gender gap services. Um, Because like I said before, um, 267.6 267.6 years to close the economic participation opportunity gap for um, in, in gender is just too long. And I don't think any of us should wait that long. Uh, totally. I am here here for that. Um, and I, I love the vision of working yourself out of a job. <laughs> Um, so I know you alluded a little bit to data feminism. Um, I know you are a data feminist. I so love this phrase. I have not read the book yet, although it's very much on my list. Um, for people listening who have never heard of data feminism, what is it and why do we need it? So there's seven key principles to data feminism, and I, I won't go through all of them. I won't bore you with all of them, but um, one of the biggest misconceptions is data feminism is only about women or data feminism is only about gender. And that's not the case. What it really is about is power and thinking and examining and challenging who has it and who doesn't. Um, And so some of the, with that, keeping that in mind, like some of the key benefits of adapting um, a, a feminist data lens to the to anyone's work really is that it allows for a more nuanced analysis of the world we live in, um, the structures that we operate in, and you know, and that inform our overall everyday experiences. Um, it's also a tool that explains how inequity and oppression is embedded in our everyday lives. And it, it, uh, it also allows for us to uncover what are the root causes of those inequities and oppression. And because if you're able to name it and if we're able to explain it, um, then we're more likely to come up with viable solutions to dismantle it and address it. And uh, the the third point I want to make in terms of those benefits is that it gives us agency to create narratives and some, in some cases, the counter narratives um, that are needed to perpetuate equity and justice. And so if we don't adopt data feminism, Um, in our work, in our everyday lives, the default is to allow for those in positions of power and and structures uh, of power to weaponize data in a way that supports dominant narratives and invisibilizes and minimizes communities that are often marginalized. And that includes 
often includes women and women of color. That being said, like, it, it will become inve- inevitable to perpetuate inequity and injustice if we don't adopt data feminism in our work. Absolutely. Well, and I know um, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, but I, I feel like in the past you've given me some really helpful examples of some like findings and insights that can be hiding in data. But if you don't look at the data specifically related to um, gender and race, you might miss those key insights. So would you mind sharing just as an example for people who are listening, how some of these insights might hide in a data set? Sure. So like one of the key ways I've seen it shown up in at least in the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion space when and thinking about um, DEI in the workplace um, is quite often when there's being any data collected or analyzed or reported on um, the work related to DEI, uh, qu- quite often race will be examined and analyzed independent of gender. And the issue or challenge with that is it invisibilizes the narrative of what's happening with women of color, for example. And um, it, and it's much more harder to understand what's happening with women of color if you cut the data in that way. Um, and, you know, like another way of thinking about it more broadly is just thinking about the question of like, who are you counting and how are you counting them? Um, so, you know, we've seen in recent years um, people embracing that a world that just doesn't focus on the gender binary of male versus female, but um, allowing space for um, non-binary folks to show up and take up space. And, you know, one of the ways, you know, how you count for that in data collection, for example, is um, ensuring that there is, they have the opportunity to identify as non-binary in that question. Mm -hmm. Um, And because you're, if you're not even giving people the opportunity to identify in that way, you're in essence, invisibilizing (laughs) that entire group of people. Um, And so, and granted, it's not a cookie cutter approach. I, I wouldn't say like to always do it one way or another. There's always like context that needs to be taken into account, but those are just like some examples in which um, that can show up in this work. Thank you so much for sharing those. That that makes so much sense and so appreciate you putting like some concrete examples to that. Um, I, I wanted to ask, I know that you're a big believer that technology is part of the answer here. And I'm curious if you can share how technology can help us solve the systemic problem of a lack of pay equity and transparency. Um, so I'll start by saying, like, in generally speaking, I, th- I think technology can definitely be part of the solution. Um, but there is a danger in thinking that technology is the solution. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like one of the ways when we think about pay equity, for example, um, I'm recently, uh, my company recently partnered with um, another company that developed software that does pay equity analysis and in the anyone that's worked in the space of like having to do a pay equity audit um or interested in doing or curious about doing a pay equity audit they'll quickly realize that it is a big undertaking in that it's um it's fairly complex to do. Mm-hmm. It's usually resource intensive in terms of the expertise you need, um, the time to do it, and, and in, and as well as like the financial investment to do it. And what the technology um, really allows companies to do is streamline that and um, allow for, you know, allow for the 
like the pay equity audits, for example, which is a key piece, like monitoring and auditing your um, your pay practices or like doing the pay equity audits on a regular basis is sort of critical for um, ensuring that there's um, pay equity at your company. And so like the technology has already been built out to ensure that companies are, are more easily able to do those audits in a consistent way um, and um, is not as resource intensive. Um, and so um, just to give like a, a, a case study to sort of highlight um, this is uh, fairly in recent years, uh, Fortune, it's, it's a Fortune 100 tech company conducted a pay audit and they quickly realized that they needed to make adjustments to salaries. And so they spent $3 million in making salary adjustments to ensure that there was equal pay. The next time they conducted the pay audit, it was what they found is once again, that there was a discrepancy in pay and then they had to spend another $3 million in salary adjustments. And so like one of the key takeaways here is that doing the pay equity audits is important and necessary, but it's not enough to address the systemic um, practices and barriers that lead to pay inequity in the first place. And so the technology has also helped sort of uncover what are some of the things that the company needs to hone in and on focus on. Um, to get and address some of those practices and barriers. Um, and so in that way, it allows for addressing both the short term and the long term issues as it relates to pay equity. Hmm. That makes so much sense because, yeah, if you figure out, okay, we're not paying people correctly and you address, you adjust the compensation to address the inequity but then you don't change the promotion process or <laughs> the exactly. hiring process or like what you're doing on the retention front to actually have a long-term holistic solution. Then you find yourself paying $3 million again a couple of years later when you redo the assessment. Yeah. And I think a lot of companies are just like daunted by what is required to do a pay equity audit. And, and again, it's, it can be an, an ambitious effort or a big undertaking, but the idea is like the technology built out like this can help minimize um, both the costs and burden that companies have to encounter when um, doing things like conducting pay audits and ensuring pay equity at the company. Thank you so much for sharing that. I want to change topics a little bit, um, actually like a, a lot bit, uh, even though it's all related. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I, Maloney, have admired um, about you is just how consistently you are showing up as a thought leader on the gender pay gap, on diversity, equity, and inclusion, on so many like really important topics on LinkedIn in particular. Um, I actually, like you gave me some really helpful tips on how to polish my own LinkedIn profile, which is just, again, so appreciated. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious that I wanted, the two things I really wanted to ask you about this are one, if someone's listening and they're like, maybe feeling like, oh, I know I should do something on LinkedIn, but I don't know, like, does it really matter? Like, what would be your top argument for why it's worth investing the time to show up on LinkedIn? Um, and then the other question, you can take these in whichever order you want, is um, if someone's okay, like, okay, I'm sold, I'm going to show up more, how would you suggest they like actually start doing that? Sure. Well, thank you for that question. Um, so let's start with your first one of why people should be engaging in LinkedIn versus another platform. Well, I do think this question comes at an interesting time given in light of recent events mm -hmm. um, <laughs> with Twitter. Um, and for me, you know, I, I would say, you know, I don't want to make this just about LinkedIn, but for me, I knew LinkedIn seemed preferable just based on 
when I think about what my strengths are and what felt most comfortable with me and how I show up. And what I mean by that more specifically is, you know, Twitter seems to, the, to be this platform, for example, that you needed to be have these very concise, witty, or pithy um, statements in order to do well on that that platform. Um, Instagram, you have to be, um, you, you know, have more of like a visual presence, obviously, and um, be all about, you know, photographing what's going on in your world or yourself. And I just found what LinkedIn, um, what really spoke to me is that it, it's a platform where you can really just write your thoughts and share your thoughts in written form. The, the other thing that is um, interesting and unique about that LinkedIn platform is it feels like it's less saturated than the other platforms. And what I mean by that is when you think about the number of users on LinkedIn, which I can't tell you the exact number at this moment, compared to how many people are consistently um creating on that platform um it, it's the number of creators is significantly low in comparison which means that well there's a lot of people consuming information but not necessarily yeah. contributing information exactly the yeah there's a lot of yeah. layers <laughs> yeah exactly and so there's a lot more opportunity to have a greater ROI when you do decide to be um, one of the one percent creators on that platform, um, and I have, you know, it, as easy it is for me to like spit out different statistics or whatnot. Well, actually, not that easy because I don't have the statistics in front of me. But I, I can say, like, I saw a huge ROI once I made the commitment to um, show up on that platform consistently, um, and. Uh, you know, I've had um, potential clients out of the blue, you know, approach me um, about uh, projects I was very excited about. Um, and, you know, very much like met the profile of my ideal client. Um, I've been invited to um, be on uh, <laughs> several podcasts like yours. Um, speaking engagements, um, and, you know, just even being an advisor or a collaborator on other projects. And they're, they're very much aligned with the work I want to do and an interested in doing. And, you know, I think LinkedIn also has more of a professional focus on professional or, uh, lives versus our personal lives, even though that starts to blend more and more in recent years, especially in light of the pandemic. So to your second question, what are your top recommendations for anyone listening um, who wants to show up more? I think the main thing in the beginning is really just getting in the practice of posting regularly. And it could be about anything or anything that like interest you like because initially I was just like posting just to get in the habit of doing it daily not necessarily making sure is like is from a marketing or branding perspective like is it the most strategic thing to talk about with obviously not veering too much off course um given the work that I do but um you know thinking through okay what is it I'm willing to commit to in terms of posting regularly on LinkedIn? What time do I need to set it aside in order to um, write on LinkedIn? And I think what helps get over sort of the emotional hump of an anxiety around po putting your work out there is really thinking it through. Someone described it to me as like writing in the sand hmm. um, <laughs> because like if no one reacts, it you know the next day it's like it's already washed away and you get to start again and so not making it seem like it's um 
like the stakes are so high in the event that you post on LinkedIn and no one engages with it or no one's impacted by it, um, I think is like a healthy and helpful perspective to have. And sort of related to that, it's so easy to get caught up in the vanity metrics of LinkedIn of like, how many views did I get? How many people liked my post? And what I have found in doing this work is that much of those don't really matter. Just speaking to the earlier example of a big potential client reaching out to me in response to what I wrote on uh, on, uh, LinkedIn, um, they did not even react (laughs) to the LinkedIn post. Totally, totally. So I I didn't... I've had that so happen I, too, where I like posted something and like the call to action was to like, we'll say like take a quiz or sign up for my mail list or whatever. And like no one who actually did the thing liked or commented on the post, but I know exactly. people looked at it because they did the thing right <laughs> after I posted it. So Right. Yeah. <laughs> And like, you know, there's a limitation of how much the platform, those algorithms can measure stuff. Um, So like, as long as you keep in front of mind, like what is the most important and priority. And like, even in the beginning, it wasn't about like, oh, I need to land so many clients through LinkedIn. It was more about like, how do I position myself as a thought leader? And like, how do I refine my voice along the way? And that was like a very good practice of just writing and treating it as like I'm writing in the sand Mm -hmm. (laughs) and refining um, as I go along, I think has been um, helpful when thinking of how to show up more on LinkedIn in a way that's, um, you know, productive and impactful. I love that. I love that. And the writing in the sand is such a powerful reminder. Um, Well, I'm curious. Uh, I love asking people this question. Uh, because I think I, I got such a wide range of answers. <laughs> and so um, sure. I'm sure there is someone out there listening who's like, oh my God, I would love to be Maloney when I grow up. Uh, <laughs> and I'm curious, uh, what advice would you, do you wish you could give your younger self? There are so many things I could say, but I think one thing that really stands out is just learning, learn to trust yourself and believe in yourself. Um, because at the end of the day, I've like realized whether I was an employee or whether I'm an entrepreneur, like the most important thing is how much I trust myself and bet on myself. Because if I can't trust myself or can't bet on myself, I can't expect expect anyone else to. Mm. Um, and so that sort of serves as like, that's the bottom line, (laughs) um, And I think, you know, where I have experienced challenges over the course of my career is when I didn't trust myself enough. Uh, Yes, it's so much easier said than done, but that self-trust muscle is so real and people can sense it. Yes, for sure. For sure. In in subtle and not so subtle ways, they can (laughs) sense it. Yeah. 100%. Uh, Well, I think you you may know that I want to ask because I ask everyone this. um, I have not secret dreams that we will have a deck of post-its one day with all these inspirational quotes uh, from the women in my world um, (laughs) of like what we all need to remind ourselves of. Um, But if you could include a message on one or two of those inspirational post-its, what reminders are top of mind for you right now? Um, so I'm reading this book actually, uh, that really focuses on, um, letting go of the things that are getting in your way in order to like help create the life that you want. Um, and so one of the key phrases she uses in the book is big, wild love. Mm. And, you know, I don't think of that just in, like, the romantic sense of things, but, like, in the work that you you do or, you know, the life that you want to live, like, what does big wild love look like? Oh, that's so juicy. Like, those three words together. <laughs> uh, I love that. What's the And what's the name of the book for anyone who's listening and wants to check it out? It, it, well, it's called Big Wild Love is the the 
main title and the subtitle is The Unstoppable Power of Letting Go. Mm. And the author is Jill Sher Murray. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. We'll be sure to link that in the show notes for anyone who's looking for big, wild love. <laughs> Uh, well, I could talk to you for hours, uh, as we both know, and um, I w- I'm sure that we will have more to discuss in the not too distant future. Um, but in the interest of time, I will leave things there. I guess the one other thing I wanted to ask is for people who are listening who uh, are obsessed with you, uh, <laughs> where is the best place for them to find you, to keep in touch with you, to follow along with your journey? Sure. Um, well, as I sort of alluded to earlier, um, I'm most active on LinkedIn. So that's a great place to find me. Um, you know, just by, I have a fairly unique name. So if you enter my name in the, the search um, tool, I should um, pop up. Amazing. And is are the rumors true? Do you have a newsletter coming out soon? <laughs> that's still in the works. Um, but, um, it keeps getting delayed, but yeah, I'm planning to come out and launch a newsletter, um, later this quarter. Awesome. Well, and I'm sure you'll share that on LinkedIn too, for people who are keeping an eye out. Thank you so, so much for joining us, Maloney. This has been so helpful. Um, so interesting, so fun. Uh, I'm definitely feeling like both daunted and excited by the prospect of, Uh, closing the gender gap. And I'm just so grateful to have you in my world and know that someone as brilliant and amazing as you is working on this. Thank you, Liz. And thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the Women Changing the World podcast. Please rate and review the Women Changing the World podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts. And don't forget to subscribe for future episodes. You can find me on Instagram. My handle is Liz.Best, that's L-I-S dot B-E-S-T, or you can find me on LinkedIn by searching my name, Liz Best. Join my mail list by visiting elizabethbest.com slash monthly meditation, and you'll receive all the latest updates on events, retreats, and opportunities to work with me, plus a monthly love note from my heart to your inbox. I am so excited to keep in touch, and I'll see you in the next episode.